Hey, this is John, and this video is going to show that recent events with the sun that are being widely documented, and which some of which I have seen with my own eyes, confirm the timing of the Amos 8 prophecy that many believe describes the phenomenon known as the Mandela Effect. In other words, this prophecy that was given to us by Amos in chapter 8 foretold an event where there would be what was described as a famine of the word over the whole earth, where men would travel over the whole earth and not be able to find the word. And this seems to be very odd in if it would happen in modernity because the Bible is everywhere and it's in so many forms. And I suppose you could introduce more naturalistic scenarios under which this prophecy could be fulfilled, like mass Bible confiscation, making the Bible illegal, mass arrests of preachers, might seem to fulfill the prophecy of a famine of the word, but it just seems hard to believe that you could eliminate every Bible printed electronic audio. It just seems impossible. Now, if you know, though, with your knower, that you're among those in the Mandela Effect community, that this thing is unexplainable. It's not misremembering. You know in your inner self that you're not misremembering and you're not a victim of confabulation or confabulation or implanted thoughts, um, then you're probably like me and you're expecting that God would have addressed this in his word so that you would not perish for lack of knowledge. And this prophecy and other passages taken together really satisfy this expectation for me. As I go back to the Bible, and I find where God warned me in advance that this would happen. And so there are two things that are very interesting about the Amos prophecy. The first is that God anchored it to a celestial event. In other words, he said, when this celestial event happens, you'll know that this prophecy is taking place. And the purpose of this video is to show that this seems to have now happened, this celestial event. And so therefore, this prophecy would be fulfilled in your hearing, like when Delilah said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. Now, the second thing is it does appear that this prophecy was given to both Amos and John the Revelator. And so we, if we take that to heart, we're also able to confirm that Amos' prophecy was clearly tied to a future event that would also take place. And what the Bible calls the end of days. So because it was given to both Amos and John, it's difficult to suggest that this prophecy already happened. That's my point. So as we go into this, I hope you'll agree that I am at least attempting to interpret these passages correctly in context. I'm not trying to force the scripture into my private interpretation. I seek to rightly divide the word. I seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the great teacher, I seek the counsel of other godly men and women. I read all of the comments as well as the commentaries on these passages. And what I'm saying seems to bear witness <clears throat> to many. I, I went on to YouTube. I looked up Amos 8 uh, sermons. I found three different preachers who preached on Amos 8. And they all drew the same conclusion independently that Amos 8 can be interpreted as a future event. Um, their reasoning is mostly because it's tied to a celestial event that is uh, described in Re Revelation 8. And uh, I'm certainly open to a more scholarly treatment of these passages. If anyone's out there with letters after your name and you'd like to chime in, please make comments. You can contact me at pleasewakeuporelse at gmail.com. And you may not have letters after your name, but you may be a pastor or some sort of influencer or patriarch or something and uh, you know we just can't get any leaders to talk to us about this to be honest with you uh, they just keep calling us names they call anyone in the Mandela Effect community a charlatan and a witch a deceiver a divider uh, sowing doubt about the inerrancy of the word of God and I understand I mean this is devastating this is really hard to get your head around the ramifications of this are so hard to accept. And, and I've heard many of the 
concerns that people have, but those concerns are not proof that it's not happening. And so leaders are strangely silent on this topic. And I'm digressing here for a second, but I'm just going to go out on a limb and I'm just going to go ahead and say what I believe is that this abdication of their responsibility to warn those entrusted to them is primarily motivated by cowardice. Forgive me, but we've been told by church leaders that they know this is happening and they're not saying anything. And they are abdicating their responsibility. They're steering clear of this topic because they know full well that if they acknowledge the mountain of empirical evidence that we're showing and the testimony of their own soul, I mean, don't tell me that you actually believe when you read the wolf laid down with the lamb that that bears witness with your spirit. You know, dear soul, that if you join the ranks of us conspiracy theorist kooks, that you're going to be castigated and vilified just as we are. I mean, they can see how we're treated. They're doing it to us. And then they're going to be called a conspiracy theorist nutcase, and they're going to be disfellowshipped. Their spouses will kick them out. Their church overseers and their congregation will fire them. They'll lose their paycheck and have to go sell insurance or something. They're going to be thrust into the dark valley of confusion and anger like we have. When we go to the word for comfort and all we find is the unfamiliar voice that feels like jagged glass and unintelligible gibberish that mocks God. And it's not the entire Bible. It's as you're reading through, you hit these passages and they're like, whoa, that is not right. And the, oh, it's just so obvious that the Bible is being tampered with. And I have addressed this theological reasons why this is absolutely being allowed by God in other videos. So we're forced as lay ministers to wade into this quagmire of complexity and grope along ourselves without our leaders, without our guides with our feeble backgrounds and undocumented credibility. Now, I mean, in all fairness, I was a youth pastor. I was a worship leader in a large church for 10 years. I've been in lay ministry for 20 years. I'm an avid student of the word during all those years. And I seek to make heaven my home and not to be swept away in the great falling away and the strong delusion that will happen during the time of the lawless one, as we're told in Second. Thessalonians. So help me. If you have a better interpretation of this and that you can show me how it's out of context, please post in the comments. So let's read this together. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I'll send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Verse 12, and they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. Now, of course, we could not have possibly imagined this passage being interpreted like this until the Mandela effect had asserted itself. And we began to notice the Mandela effect and look into it. So Let's first look at the context of this passage, because that's always a first argument that's thrown up at you if you uh, spouse a biblical position that somebody disagrees with. Um, so what is the context? Is there any indication that this passage speaks about the last days? Is there any inference to the last days? So we look in verse 2. I don't have that posted here. But in verse 2 of Amos 8, God says, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Now listen to this. Then said the Lord unto me, the end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. Interesting. Interesting. Sounds like end times inference is inserted right in the beginning of this prophecy. Just saying. Just a side note, there's another thought. Notice right at the beginning that God finds it necessary to make a point of showing Amos what he's showing him. He's saying, hey, pay attention here. Pay attention. Look here. Almost like God knows 
that Amos will not be able to see unless God makes him look closely. This is what we're asking our brothers and sisters to do. Stop making excuses, stop casting aspersions, and look into this with an open heart and mind. Put your a priori arguments aside and your normalcy bias and your preconceived notions of what's theologically possible and look at 500 examples of, of Mandela effects. Because after about 100 or 200, you'll be convinced. The reason you're not convinced is because you haven't looked at enough examples, period. We see this as the most baffling facet of this phenomenon. The widespread unwillingness combined with the widespread inability to see or acknowledge these changes. The changes are so plentiful and so obvious, yet 95% of Christians refuse to look at it. They have all different kinds of reasons why they won't look at it. And when they do look at it, it's like they refuse to see. It is a willful ignorance. And the very few who are willing to look and who do see will mostly immediately relegate this to the unimportant category. This is widely reported. And this response is of all responses the most disturbing and the most astonishing. The only way that you can say that the Mandela effect doesn't matter is if you don't believe it's happening. How can you say that the Bible being supernaturally changed by some mysterious methodology at the quantum level or whatever it is, is not important? You can't. But these few who are admitting it is happening yet are able to shrug it off and go about their lives like it's some quirky anomaly that isn't worth the time of day, that's just... It's unfathomable to us. This kind of impenetrable blindness is referenced all through Scripture, though. Having eyes to see, they will see not. God told people to go preach, and they won't listen to you. In Job 33, we see this passage. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceives it not. So I pray that you would see. I pray that you would have a heart that loves the truth. Just put your agenda down. Aristotle said the mark of an educated man is the ability to consider a matter without embracing it. And there's passages of scripture that say the same thing. So how about verse 9? It shall come to pass in that day. Now what day is he talking about? The day that there will be a famine of the word. Okay? In that day, when there's a famine of the word, I will cause the sun to go down at noon. Okay, so that's what he's saying. I will darken the earth in the clear day. So here's the sign when the famine of the word will be here. Here's this little buzzer and this flashing light, okay, that indicates the cake is done. This is a time marker to let you know when in history this event will be happening. God is saying, Here's how you know the sun's not going to go down. Or I'm sorry, the sun will go down in the middle of the day. Okay, so has it happened? Here's one example in Stockholm where it was all over the news during the day. The sun didn't shine. You say, well, there was cloud cover. <laughs> I'm going to show you that that didn't happen here in Siberia. Mystery surrounds Arctic Siberia as day turns to complete darkness for three hours. Okay, Amos 8, 9, I will cause the sun to go down at noon. All right, so in this article, what we read is the region was hit by bizarre darkness between when? 1130 and 2. That's noonday. And so there it is. There it is, there it is, there it is. The sun went down at noonday for the space of about three hours. And so officialdom came out and said, contradicting the residents, that uh, they were reporting layers of dust, and the officialdom said there was no dust. People who live here for many years said that they had never witnessed anything like this. The darkness was pitch black. It didn't come at once, but grew gradually. The sun was gone. 
from 11.30 to 2. Local officials said there was no rain, dust, smoke, or a sharp air temperature drop in the region during the event. However, they said that almost all Arctic districts reported a significant temperature fall. This is also confirmed by different websites that showed in that region during that period of time on that day there was no clouds from weather there was no clouds from fires there was no clouds from dust storms and no volcanic activity okay so i'm going to show you a video here and i just ask you to have an open mind because if it wasn't a dust storm it wasn't clouds it wasn't smoke it wasn't f from a fire what was it and I'm going to attempt to answer your question, but you're not going to like it. Okay? So just watch this. The images we are viewing were obtained over the past few days from the Federal Aviation Weather Cameras in Alaska and Canada. Each image is 10 minutes apart from the next, and they form a time-lapse video when strung together, such as the one playing now, taken from cameras in different locations throughout Alaska. The black dot in front of the sun is equipment that NASA launched hundreds, possibly thousands of miles from the Earth's surface. It casts a reflection upon the water, proving that it's not a camera or lighting issue, but it's an actual piece of equipment, and it's viewed from many different cameras. This black dot equipment is capable of producing an enormous glare, hundreds of miles in diameter, possibly thousands of miles. It always tracks in perfect synchronization with the sun. So essentially, the circular glare is always between Earth and the sun, but much closer to the Earth, of course. There is nothing special about this old video from Portage Glacier, Alaska, a year ago. The sun is seen passing behind a post. The importance of these frames is that we are looking at the real sun, Notice how the sun passes behind a post, and the post cannot hide the sun because the real sun is too large to be hidden behind a small post. I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. You'll see in a moment why this is important. Here's an interesting sign in the sky viewed from the west-facing camera in Burwash in the Yukon Territory. We see what looks like the sun, but it's not. As it passes behind a thin post, it completely disappears from view. The reason this is happening is because the light source we are viewing is the glare produced by the black dot equipment that reflects upon the water surface. Where's the real sun? It is currently behind a dark nebula that we will be looking at in just a minute. To refresh your memory on the approximate size of the real sun, here is an inset of the real sun we just saw moments ago in Portage Glacier. The real sun could never be hidden behind a thin flagpole. We see the same phenomena occurring in Drumheller, Alberta in Canada. The light source is seen traveling across the sky and then it is completely hidden behind a tiny street light. Just to refresh your memory <clears throat> on the size of the sun again, Here's an inset from Portage Glacier. The real sun could never disappear behind a street light. Now that you know how the manufactured light works, it will help you to understand the dark nebula we are viewing in this footage from the south-facing camera in Attawapiskat, Ontario in Canada. Notice how bright everything is as the sun rises over on the left. Then. Suddenly, the sun appears to shrink to one-fifth its size. That's because the real sun has just gone behind the dark nebula, and the manufactured glare is now in front of it. However, the artificial light is no match for the real sun because it almost looks like nighttime. Eventually, the real sun emerges from behind the nebula, and the landscape suddenly brightens, and the sun returns to its normal size again. Let's run through this again. The sun rises on the left. The landscape is bright. The sun suddenly shrinks to one-fifth its size, causing the landscape to darken as the real sun moves behind the uh, dark nebula. The manufactured glare moves across the sky in front of the helium-4 dark nebula. Notice the amazing texture of the nebula as the light moves across it. 
it would be wonderful to be able to get a closer look at this structure. The light passes over the nebula, tracking in perfect synchronization with the sun. The landscape suddenly brightens as the real sun emerges from behind the nebula and the sun resumes its normal size again. A total eclipse is occurring here, viewed from the southeast facing weather camera located in Ugonic Bay, Alaska. As the manufactured glare approaches the two orbs, it illuminates them. Technology is in place to blur these objects. Some contrast helps to see these two celestial objects. We know these cannot be lens flares because the manufactured light is actually reacting to these objects. Notice how the glare reaches out toward the orb. These objects are between the sun and the earth. Thus, when this eclipse occurs, the manufactured circular glare stays in front of the celestial object while the real sun passes behind it, just like it did in the nebula we just saw a moment ago. This process successfully conceals a total eclipse. The enemies of Christ do not want you to know we are close to the end. They do not want you to turn your life over to Christ while there is still time. Information is at the end of this video. Okay, so what I'd like to point out, first of all, is for those seeking confirmation regarding whether or not the Mandel effect is real, is you now have a celestial event that ties itself to this prophecy, further indicating that this prophecy is about the Mandel effect and it is happening. Now, the reason that it's happening is very complicated. You heard her mention a nebula, some people will say Nibiru, and what she is suggesting is so outrageous and difficult for people to believe that I don't expect many to, you know, agree with this information that I'm showing you. And I have some more here that I'm going to try to show you, to help you. Uh, but what's astonishing to me is how many Christians come away looking at a video like this and they'll be just rolling their eyes and just swooning with just a mocking spirit that anyone would be so uninformed to fall for such Photoshop nonsense. Now instead, these people that pride themselves as Bible believers and knowing God and knowing the truth prefer to pledge their allegiance to a priesthood of Freemasons and enemies of God and a, uh, a data sphere of data that is proven to be godless and wants to lead men astray. These astronauts and scientists in white lab coats who preach a message in direct contradiction to what the Bible teaches. So you see that there is evidence in your face that the astronauts are Freemasons. You see on the left there, the scale of the Mason and all of the evidence that they put out there for you to see, because that's their dogma. If there's any doubt, here's a commemorative coin with the Freemason logo right on it. So these Christians who mock those who are in the truth community worship NASA and the Luciferian elites that use scientism to mesmerize humanity into accepting elaborate hoaxes regarding the true nature of reality. And they take whatever these people tell them without engaging their own intellect because they have been taught to trust the expert and that it's arrogant to think for yourself. And officialdom will continually scold you into turning off your brain by suggesting that you've wandered into forbidden territory by asking the things that you're asking. They'll say, well, do you have an astrophysics degree? Insinuating that you're out of bounds and get back into line like a good slave. Stop thinking. 
But scientism is not science. It's, it's pure theory, delivered intentionally as pure fact. And in many cases, it's pure fabrication. It's bold-faced lying, a premeditated charade dressed up and delivered by actors like this guy, Bill Nye, who was an actor before he came on the scene as the spokesperson for scientism. Posing as a scientist made to look like a scientist, so you'll accept his agenda. And this is his agenda, is to put you in jail if you question the official story. And you're seeing this trend being ratcheted up and censorship and asking for those that deny vaccines or GMOs or climate change to be put in jail. And this guy, Neil deGrasse Tyson, is out on the forefront trying to convince you of the world view. Now, we were all told evolution was real because they had the missing link and the fossils to prove it. They had Piltdown Man, and that was then proven to be the nose of a pig, and they knew that. They knew that all along. They just wanted to trick you because they're Luciferians. They're Freemasons going back all the way back to all of the scientists you've ever heard of, practically. And they do this in an effort to get you to doubt God and to deny God. This monkey to a man graphic is only a small portion of the elaborate hoax that has been perpetrated against you, dear soul. Think about it. There's billions of people that this conspiracy has worked on. These scientists know that this is nonsense. They know it's, there's no evidence to support this. So, getting back to my original premise here, it says in Luke 21, 25, that there will be signs in the sky and the moon and the stars. So, you turn out to be the lucky contestant that has this prophecy fulfilled during your lifetime. But many are so indoctrinated into a heliocentric worldview by NASA, which means deception, and has the icon of a snake tongue, uh, you've been indoctrinated to accept everything that they feed you and not to question it. A worldview given to you by NASA, an elaborate hoax of Freemason priesthood. And then it's showed to you and it's happening right in front of you and you can't see it and you refuse to believe it's happening. So I recently on December 27th, 2019, saw two separate suns in the sky with my own eyes as I was driving home from Buffalo over the holidays. I was not mistaken. I was not under controlled substances. I had my glasses on. Now my dear wife saw it and she refused to believe it with her own eyes. She said it was a rainbow. I've never seen such denial in my life. And God bless her. I love her. And I know that a lot of people are like that. Uh, but this is really happening. And what you just saw was not photoshopped. And you need to understand that NASA was created as part of Operation Paperclip after World War II and was populated with Nazi scientists. That's right. And the intent was to deceive humanity into believing the space and the moon landing and the ISS and all the satellites. It's all designed to get you to ultimately to deny God, just like this picture here. It's just on a much larger scale. I mean, think of how elaborate this little hoax is right here. And it's worked to f deceive billions. But, you know, the movie Gravity had a $100 million budget. Do you know how much NASA's budget is? $55 million a day. Anyway, the whole spinning ball Earth in the massive universe is designed to make you feel insignificant. And they say that over and over. But see, the Bible is very clear that the Earth is stationary. And it's in context. It's not out of context. And if you go and stand out in the field, 
Does the Earth seem like it's spinning at a thousand miles an hour? If the Earth is round, why is it flat? Because when you can see 200 miles, that's impossible on a round Earth. It should be hidden behind miles of curvature. So all these easy to see empirical evidences can't just be brushed aside anymore because humanity's waking up and God is pulling back the veil of what's really out there, okay? A simulated sun array made by a German company so they can simulate the sun. And you think, well, you know, there's probably decent reasons for that, patents to, uh, you know, test different things. You could test satellites. You could test solar panels with this fake sun. Yes, perhaps. The problem is that people are seeing the fake sun all over the world and they're videoing it. And I personally saw two suns. And you can call me a liar if you want, but I know what I saw. And so something is happening up in the sky that's kind of unexplainable, you see. And then, of course, the elites always put what they're doing into the data sphere. And it has to do with the dogma that they operate under. And if so if they show you what they're doing in their movies, in their literature, and you see it with your own eyes, but you are, your brain is turned off from years of indoctrination, then they are without guilt. And I believe that goes to the courts of heaven. There's jurisdictions of courts in heaven, and they go and they plead their case about their tyranny over humanity. And they say, see, we show them in these movies what we're doing to them, and they still don't see it, so they deserve to have us rule over them. But you can see the expression on this guy's face here, Jim Carrey. And uh, this is all of humanity waking up to just how hosed we have been. Only those that are humble can admit how incredibly blind they've been. So this thing falls out of the sky in the movie, and he goes over and picks it up. This is the Truman Show, right? It's a f the guy lives in a fake world. And so this stage light falls out of the sky and when he picks it up you can see it has the word cirrus on it so when the stage light falls from the sky it's labeled cirrus indicating that the light is used as the star uh-oh uh-oh i wonder i wonder if it could actually be happening i wonder if the videos that show these hexagon shaped images in the sky that are kind of clouded over but they can clearly be seen or even that sun that you're looking at right there seems to have that hexagon shape could it be that there really is a dome over the earth like they say and they have some track system that they're using to cover up the sun disappearing for three or four hours every day as it goes behind the nebula cloud or nibiru who knows i mean we live in the truman show okay and here's the company spectral lab manufacturers world standard steady state and pulse solar simulators i went to their website they have all kinds of technology and they have a whole section on space the application of their fake sun for space so let me show you how easy it is to see that this whole thing is fake okay and you can do this yourself i did this today how far up is the International Space Station? See, there it is in Google. I put that into Google, and Google officialdom, as I call it, returned an answer of 254 miles up. Okay, now just bear with me. All right, so how high up is the thermosphere in miles? Well, according to officialdom, the thermosphere is between 56 and 621 miles. And the International Space Station is 254 miles. So the space station is right in the middle of the thermosphere. All right? Now, what is the temperature in the thermosphere? The temperature is between 932 degrees Fahrenheit and 3,632 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what official dim will tell you if you Google that right now. All right, let's ask this question. What is the International Space Station made of? 
The most common material is 2219-T6 aluminum alloy. It's made of aluminum, okay? But I looked that up specifically, and see, what is the melting point of 2219-T6 aluminum alloy? And there's your answer. It's about 1,000 degrees. See where it says melting temperature? 1,009 degrees Fahrenheit. So here's my question. Naysayer. Why doesn't the International Space Station melt? If the ISS is clearly sitting right in the middle of the thermosphere, if the ISS is made up of aluminum, if the thermosphere is between 923 degrees and 3,600 degrees, and the melting point of aluminum is 1,000 degrees, it's at the low end of the temperature, why doesn't the ISS melt? Well, guess what? I put that question into the data sphere, and this is the answer that I got. Why don't satellites melt in the upper thermosphere? Well, the gas pressure at the height is so low, at that height, is so low that the thermal mass of the gas molecules is almost zero. Yes, each molecule has a very high temperature, but there are so few of them that they just can't increase the temperature of the satellites. So they're saying because there's very few molecules up there that there's no transfer of the heat to the International Space Station itself. Here's another article, and it says even though the individual particles have a, have a lot of energy, high temperature, they don't hold much heat energy overall. All right, so what you're looking at is complete nonsense. Because guess what? The satellite is made of particles, right? So they're saying that because there aren't a lot of particles in the air, up in space, that there's not, even though it's hot, it's not hot. But what they don't explain is then what happens when the solar rays hit the International Space Station itself. That's made of particles, and it would conduct the heat, and therefore the thing would melt like a candle. Okay? So you're being sold a bill of goods. Isaac Asimov invented satellites, and if you go Google satellites, all you'll see is cartoons. There's no real satellites. Your satellites are all ground-based. Okay? What are you looking at here? What is that? That's the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, but I just want you to answer the question. What are you looking at? What is that? Is it a picture? Who took the picture? Is it an image from space of our galaxy? Because if it is, it would have to be millions of light years out in space. And, you know, I'm going to tell you the truth. As a grown man, I just realized this recently, like a year ago. I've looked at this thing all my life, and it would usually have a little arrow saying, you are here. And I just thought in my mind, well, that was a picture of the galaxy. It's a cartoon. It's a fabrication to get you to believe in space. There's no satellite out there that took a picture of the Milky Way galaxy. Now, what is this? This is what we've been told our whole life is a picture of the Earth from outer space. And you know what it really is? It's a composite of 12 different strips of data that are then formatted and photoshopped by NASA. And it's called the Big Blue Marble. And it's a complete fabrication. And they admit that. It's not a picture. It's an image. That's how they get around it legally. It's 12 strips of data sewn together. And then they add the clouds and the colors. And they make it look like a nice thing. And, you know, it's fake. It's not what you've been told. And you'll notice how fake it is. This is the real image. If you Google Earth from space, this is what you'll get. Notice that there's no stars. It's nothing. There's no stars because they can't fake the stars because people will be able to know that it's fake because they have star charts and everything. This is what they've held up to us our whole life and gotten us to believe in this massive charade. Remember, they have a 550, they have a $55 million a day budget. And you say, what are you telling me? That all the uh, space programs around the world are fake? 
Ah, they all have a treaty. Every country has a treaty not to uh, let anybody into the South Pole. Why is that? Why are we always at war, but we get along on that? And why do all the emblems of all the space industries or uh, space programs in every country have the same signet, pretty much? They all have the sigil, little tongue of the uh, serpent, because they're all run by the devil. All right? So here's, an, here's a question. Do you believe that the Earth's core is molten? Yes or no? Do you believe it's molten? Yes or no? Okay? And you say, well, how do you know it's molten? And the answer is because you've been told. All your life, you've believed what you're told. And all I'm asking you is to stop doing that. Okay? Just like you don't believe the monkey to the man is true because the Word of God contradicts it. Well, here's what officialdom tells you the thickness of the mantle is 1,800 miles, and the outer core is 1,400 miles. So it's, it's 3,200 miles before you get to the core, okay? But they're going to show it to you like it's fact. That's what scientism does. Scientism tells you what is fact, but they have no way of knowing. Even like this galaxy. I looked up, how do we know that the Milky Way galaxy is... 100,000 light years across. And you know what their answer is? Well, we don't know. It's like if you're strapped to a tree and trying to figure out how big the forest is. That's what they say. But they've held it up like they know our whole life. And they hold up these images like they are real our whole life. And then they tell you that the Earth's core is, a, is molten our whole life. But guess what? That's 3,200 miles down to the core. And guess how far the deepest hole ever dug is? Kola super deep borehole in Russia is the deepest hole that humans have ever dug. Here's a picture of the actual hole, and it went 8.3 miles down. That's it. 8.3. Okay, so look at that. It didn't even get through the first little crust top part. So how do they know that the Earth's core is molten? Okay, do you know what, if you look that up, what they'll tell you? They'll say, well, we have advanced radar beams that go into the Earth, and when it bounces back, we're able to tell that the Earth's core is molten. Well, you can believe that if you want, but I don't believe the monkey guy, wherever he is, I don't believe that the Earth would have a picture with no stars and I'm not believing in these cartoons anymore. And so, it's really up to you at this point if you want to be like Cypher in The Matrix who called a meeting with Agent Smith and was like, I'm sick of living in this hellish experience. I'd rather go back into The Matrix I know that I'm eating this steak and it's completely fake and it's all in my mind, but I don't care. It tastes delicious. Just make me rich and I would rather live a lie. But if you love the truth and you really don't care where the truth takes you because you know God is pleased with you when you love the truth, then you need to decide once and for all that all of the opposition against the truth movement, the censorship, I'm going to say it, Alex Jones, man, have they turned him into a pariah, and yet he's the most attacked news outlet by officialdom and the, the global controllers. Oh, he's a kook. Well, I think you might want to reconsider who you think is a kook and who you think is an enemy of humanity. And you might want to stop calling people conspiracy theorists because that's a character assassination term. And it's a term created by the CIA in 1963 to combat people who were questioning the assassination of JFK, which thanks to President Trump, those documents were now released. And we now know that there was two shooters. So every time you call somebody a conspiracy theorist, you are 
an accomplice to a crime. You are perpetrating and furthering the deception that that word, that term was created for. It was to quell and silence people who love the truth. It was to shame them into silence. And the greatest conspiracy is, the greatest conspiracy theory is that there are no conspiracies. So this is really a, a last day's chapter that we're in, the things that are happening. And I just encourage you to open your heart and mind to these topics that have been verboten by the church, 9-11, um, was a seminal moment for many. And if you can look at 9-11 and come away from that, believing the official story with all the evidence that shows how obvious it was, then I fear for your soul, for what's coming on the earth. The deceptions that are coming on the earth and are here now with Mandela Effect and other things are going to sweep many Christians away. So I just encourage you to go to my channel, Wake Up or Else, watch some of the other videos and email me at please wake up or else at gmail.com or make comments there and I would love to correspond with you. If you're a pastor or church leader, please reach out to me by email. I would love to speak with you on this and any topic. God bless.